Hello guys and welcome to another Sound Booth tutorial. I'm Daniel Jason Booth and uh, today I would like to take you through some compression listening tests. There are some people in the audio industry that shy away from compression and that's because of the bad rep it's got through the loudness war and I think it's unwarranted because it is one of the most musical tools we have. We often overlook how to use compression musically. Now this is a very subtle lesson. What I'm trying to impart I guess to you guys is the subtleties of compression and how we can use compression not for loudness but to enhance an instrument and um, hopefully I've achieved that with the session that I've got today. So I've got a jazz session um, as you can see in my Pro Tools capture here I've got all the faders at zero so it's it's been very well recorded and balanced. The only thing I've done is I've added a bit of EQ to the piano and a bit of tube warmth and EQ so I'm going to give you three different examples. One will be uncompressed, the next will be compressed, and the next will also be compressed. And I've, I've tried my best to level match each of those examples. So you're hearing the compression and not the loudness, which is influencing your perception of how that instrument feels. Hopefully by the time this gets to YouTube, you'll be able to hear the difference. I'm going to try my best to describe and impart what it is that I'm getting out of the compression and what the compression is adding that I've got on there. So in one case, I'm compressing for feel or for groove, for movement. And the other case, I am compressing for loudness, which is kind of nullified in this example because I've balanced that out again. So all the examples are the same volume in terms of their perceived loudness, hopefully. <laughs> anyway, that's enough talking. Let's have a listen. I'm not going to show you what you're listening to. I'm just going to call them A, B and C. And then we'll get a, a little bit deeper into the settings and, and what I've done. And I really do hope you can hear the difference. Okay, so hopefully you can hear the differences between those. What I'd like to do now is just give you a shorter example. Once again, I'm not going to show you the screen, so here we go. Let's have a look at the settings. So I've got on the bass, I have this much compression happening. Let's have a listen to the piano.
So if you have a fine ear, you could probably hear that this is example C. Let's bring up these horns. And all together. So I've actually got no compression happening on the drums. So hopefully I didn't fool you into listening to the drums. So in that example, what I've done is I've compressed for loudness and this is quite acceptable. You know, it doesn't sound bad. I wouldn't say that it sounds bad, but I would say that it is subjectively not as good as the other version that I've got here. So I've got the exact same plugins on the uh, insert slot above that. And the settings are pretty different. So in terms of the settings, the top one, I'm actually using 20 to one. The differences are in the attack and the release. And in terms of how much I'm driving in the compressor, it's, it's quite different. We know from my BF76 tutorial that the lower ratios on an 1176 actually provide a lower threshold, which is probably why there's more makeup gain there. The settings are not so much important as what is happening when we compress something. So in terms of compressing for feel, what I'm looking for is I don't want the compressor to lock down and never ever release. There are exceptions to that. It really depends on how the compressor releases. Let's have a look at the bass and we'll look at the two different types of compression. And I don't think one way is necessarily right or wrong, but I do think there are benefits to compressing for feel over loudness. And I'll go into those later. So that is quite a bit more compressed in terms of what the compressor is doing. You'll see that the compressor never quite gets back to zero, whereas we did before. We're not compressing more than three to four decibels. It's not really so much how much you compress. What is more important is the intent with which we compress something. If our intent is to listen for changes that affect the groove, the timing, the movement, then I think that makes us listen in a different way. Let's just have a listen to the compressed version, which is compressing for feel. And as a direct comparison to what it started out as. So to me, that's, that's a fairly well played double bass part and most of the notes are quite even. If you're compressing for loudness, then you'll be trying to squash those out even more. All right, so the difference is in the intent with which we want to compress something. So when I was thinking about the compressor settings on this version, I was really trying to get a different feeling from the compression. I want the compressor to just add a sense of movement to the sound. So it's not so much about squashing peaks and it's definitely not doing that because the attack is wide open. The transient's coming through and then the compressor's kicking in and it's just coming in after that. And the release is quite short, so it's not always locked into compressing the sound. 
And as a general guideline, I think that's not a bad way of compressing if you're compressing for feel because it allows you to drive a little bit harder into the compressor and that gives us more freedom to get a bit more movement. It's following the envelope of the bass still, but because it's just knocking it down just a little bit here and there, it's letting those transients through and it's releasing in time for the next hit or the next note. It imparts its own time over that instrument. So with that in mind, I want you to close your eyes. Don't look at the screen because the screen is not important here. What is important is how it sounds. Okay, I'll bypass that. Let's move on to the piano. Let's bypass that. So I guess the point of this exercise is to, to really try and exaggerate the dynamics at the same time as evening out the sound. You can hear that a lot of that low piano stuff, if I could just go back through, I think it was at the beginning on the third phrase. So that's all fairly evened out, but it still sounds lively. Let's um, bypass. Even on that second phrase, the dun 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 dun, you can hear that it kind of loses a little bit of energy. And that's what we want to try to enhance with compression. here it's just lifted that up a little bit moving on to the horns let's go to the trumpet first all right with the compressor on it Let's have a, another listen to that. As a visual guide, as a visual reference, that needle coming down, think of that as shaping the envelope of the sound and just imparting a little bit of a randomness to it, I guess, and just some movement on top of that instrument. So it's evening it out, but it's also serving the function of keeping everything feeling really up in the energy respect. Let's have a look at the other alternate compressor setting that I've got here, which is compressing for loudness. Now for a parallel track doing parallel compression, that's probably going to be quite acceptable. But when you compare the two, There is a real difference to how lively and how big that sounds. 
You may not hear the difference yet, but it's the cumulative effect of these compressors working together. Let's move on to the trombone. To me, that sounds, you know, it's there's not a lot of dynamic interest to that. The feel of the compression on top of that. To me, when it's uncompressed, it sounds just a little bit one dimensional. Uh, let's have a look at the other alternate compressed version. So just looking at the differences in settings there. Same sort of thing, the attack to catch some of the transients. The release isn't all that different. The uh, ratios are the same. The input and output are quite a bit different. I'm guessing the reason for that is that I wanted to catch more of the transients, got the faster attack, and we're compressing it more, so therefore it's getting squashed into a smaller dynamic range and is perceivably louder. Let's just quickly AB through all of these, or ABC through these. So to me, that is that is good compression. That's not doing too much to the signal. It's just it's maintaining the dynamics of the performance. It's squashing it a little bit. And hopefully when we get back to listening to all the instruments in the mix, you'll be able to hear the difference. Let's move on to saxophone without compression. <laughs> with compression. So I can hear the, that that is quite squashed. Let's bring up the other version here. sounds a little bit flat. There's not a lot of dynamic interest in that. So the idea with that is just to get the instrument to bounce a little bit. This definitely does not bounce. And that is a classic example of compressing for loudness. You can also hear from having the faster attack setting that the sound has actually gotten darker. Let's have a look at the horns master. I don't think I'm doing a lot there. It's just to kind of bring all of these parts together. It's just a little bit of glue without it, without everything. To my ears, there's a little bit more buoyancy. It's just floating as opposed to it's too much of the same thing. And so just that little bit of dynamic interest makes a difference. This is probably getting a little bit esoteric, but to me, this is the last 5% of getting a record to sound amazing you shouldn't really be able to hear much of a difference. And that's the point. The only thing you should be able to hear is that there's an energy shift. There should be more bounce. There should be an undefinable quality to the sound that wasn't in it before. Now that we've got to the end here, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to play the uncom I'm going to play it without the drums because the drums have no compression whatsoever on them.
even in this uh, little piano thing, you might be able to hear more of a difference. To me, that sounds a little bit flatter. With the compression, it feels a bit more lively. The other thing I think compression does really well is just adds a little bit of depth. And what that is, is it's the volume changes that are happening. Volume is depth. So you get reverb pushing sounds back, you get depth from having things louder in a mix or softer. They're softer, they feel further away. The more reverb, they feel even further away. And so if you've got a compressor and it's just doing this, then it's changing, it's kind of um, changing the depth of that sound, which is one of the cool things about this type of compression. Compressing for loudness, to me that kind of defeats the object of what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep the performance, the dynamics of the performance without totally killing it. Taking it that far has totally killed it. So with that in mind, listening for the, the depth that the compression offers, Adding in the compression. I can almost, listening to that version, see the musicians in the room as they're playing. Once again. It sounds like the rehearsal. It feels flat. That feels energetic. It imparts a sense of depth. I know it's not a huge sense of depth. It's not like listening to a reverb, but it's got a liveliness to it that it didn't have before. And once again, listening to Compressing for Feel. Let's throw the drums back in. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed that. If you do have any questions about this technique, please hit me up with them below in the comments section. As I explained at the beginning of the video, the difference is in the intent the intent with which you compress something. And so thinking of it like that, don't worry about the meters, although they are a very good indication of how the compressor is working on the sound. I guess the lesson here is level match and really understand what the compressor is doing to the sound. And uh, hopefully that has broadened your horizons and your understanding of compression. So I really hope you got something out of that. It is quite a subtle thing but hopefully my going through it has helped um, elevate your understanding, give you an alternate point of view on, on how we can use compression. We're told to compress for loudness, to squash down peaks, but what if we can get music to come alive? That's the type of compression we should be aiming for, not the loudness type. So please like, subscribe, uh, comment below, and uh, I'll see you in future videos. Happy mixing, guys.